Hello everybody and welcome to another audiobook. So this is the second story in Gumdrop Angel, which is the, oh my gosh, is it the eighth? Yeah, it's the eighth Fazbear Frights book. Oh, it says it up here. Uh, it's the eighth Fazbear Frights book, uh, second story, Sergio's Lucky Day. Now I'm really excited for this one because I don't know much about it. Um, and so this could this could literally go anywhere. I've heard that the other two stories are actually darker than the first story um, So that's this is this is exciting <laughs> um, So if you do enjoy then make sure that you subscribe so that you see when I upload more audiobooks uh, And yeah, we're gonna get straight into it Sergio looked up from his drafting board and squinted Oh, yeah, sorry. There's like a double s so I was really I was confused, and squinted in annoyance at the bright sunshine blasting through the water wall windows along the front of the office building. He shifted to avoid being blinded, and he rubbed at the afternoon kink in his neck. He checked the time on his new stainless steel aviator-style watch, 2.32pm. He peered at the subdials within the main dial of his watch. His watch had three subdials, and he had no use for any of them, but they looked impressive. And things that looked impressive made him feel impressive. Above all, that was what Sergio wanted to be, impressive. I keep telling you, you have to be careful what you wish for, Serge. Sergio jerked towards the man who'd come up behind him, and he knocked over his coffee mug in the process. It went flying. Uh, but the man, Dale, Sergio's supervisor, caught it. Dale was a senior manager in their architectural firm, and a big guy, an ex-football player, to boot. The monk looked puny in his uh, in his massive hand, sorry. Now you've gone and done it, Dale said, flicking a few drops of coffee from his wrist. Thankfully, there wasn't much left in the mug. The sun hit the top of Dale's shaved head, and it shined so bright it looked like a halo. Sorry, Dale, didn't mean to throw a mug at you. What? Dale looked down at the mug, then thrust it back at Sergio. Forget the mug. You got it, Serge. You got the project manager job. Sergio stood, then grinned. Really? I thought the decision wasn't going to be made until next week. It got pushed up, because Sanders is leaving sooner than we thought he was. Sergio slid his shiny black wingtips over the grey carpet and in an abbreviated moonwalk back toward the sunshine behind him. Then he twirled and did a fist bump. Dale chuckled. Congratulations, he held out his hand. Sergio shook his hand, but then he frowned. What did you mean by what I by what you said? What did I say? Well, you said two things. Be careful what you wish for, and now you've gone and done it. Well, you do realise how hard project managers work, right? Are you ready to start living at the office? Sergio laughed. Dale didn't. Sergio sobered. Are you serious? Dale grinned and punched Sergio's arm. Only a little. You'll probably only have to sleep here three or four nights a month. Sergio nodded as if that, as if that was fine, but it really wasn't. The truth was that when he applied for the project manager job, he hadn't really been thinking about what the job would be like. He applied because it was the next logical step up from where he was. He was on a fast track to the top, and staying on that track meant applying for promotions, whether you wanted to do more work or not. At 27, he defied the laws of becoming an architect to get to where he already was. He got through hot he got through the college and post-grad work needed by the time he was 21. He was hired by the best architectural firm in town and had his license by the time he was 22. It took him only three years to get to senior architect, much to the annoyance of several older architects who had got passed over. And now he was the firm's youngest ever project manager. Why was he able to do all of this? Well, one, he was an architectural phenom ever since he was a kid, he had a head for numbers and an eye for spatial relationships. He knew how to mould physical reality into something eye-catching. And two, he was determined. He was so determined to reach the top that he willed himself to work as hard as he had to. Nothing could stop him from getting what he wanted. But lately, he'd begun to wonder whether what he wanted was really what he wanted. Earth to Surge, Dale said. Lost you there. Sergio shook his head. Sorry. Don't worry, Dale said. We won't make you sleep here tonight. Dale let loose with one of his full laughs, which was just one step below a sonic boom. Sergio noticed that not a single head on the design floor lifted at the sound. Everyone was used to it. Dale tapped Sergio's drafting desk. I'll let you get back to it, 
but after work we should go out for dinner to celebrate your promotion. Say 7.30. Oh, and you'll need to pack up your stuff. I'll have janitorial bring you boxes. They'll be moving your things into your office tomorrow. Sergio smiled. That was another reason he'd applied for the project manager job. He was going to get his own office, an enclosed space. No more working out here in the open with the other junior and senior architects. Now that was impressive. As soon as Dale strode away, Sergio's closet worked buddy. Both in terms of desk lo location and time spent together, Clive threw a wadded up piece of paper at him. Congrats, you idiot. Sergio deflected the ball of paper and said, You're just jealous. Not even a little, idiot. Clive shook his round head and his bushy brown hair flew into his eyes. For at least the thousandth time, Sergio marvelled at how much his friend looked at Bubbles, the chocolate labradoodle Clive, and his girlfriend Fiona, another architect of the firm, doted on. It wasn't just Clive's brown curly hair, it was his big brown eyes, the earthy tones he was dressed in, and the fluid way he moved, always ready for some kind of fun. Once, Sergio told Clive that he looked like Bubbles, and Clive responded, well, yeah, you look like Trotter. Sergio had to laugh at that. Trotter was Dale's dog, a spoiled miniature pinscher, and <laughs> I don't know that breed, what? Uh, and Sergio could actually see the re resemblance. Like Trotter, he was small and compact and slender, and he had a somewhat pointed nose. Also, like Trotter, though, he was muscular and sleek. He wore his black hair slicked back, and he always dressed in dark-fitted clothing. He knew he wasn't good-looking, but he did his best to have his own impressive style. And his girlfriend, Violet, a junior architect of the firm, didn't seem to mind how he looked. You realise I'm your boss now, Sergio reminded Clive. Clive snorted. Fine, Mr. Idiot. Sergio grinned, shook his head, and tried to concentrate on his work. Is that the only insult he knows? Is it... I kind of like Clive, even though he just says idiot all the, in every single line. He just says idiot. That's great. Most of the, the, most of the department came to Sergio's promotion dinner. Considering it was short notice for everyone, Sergio thought that was impressive. He hoped it was because he was well liked and not because they were sucking up. But he couldn't tell. He could never tell with people. He didn't re read people, not even Violet, who he'd, the, who he'd been dating for almost a year. He was often unsure about what she was really thinking. Did she mean it when she said he was awesome? Or was she dating him because he was moving up in the firm and she thought he'd take her with him? That was why he had to rely on hard work to get him the life he wanted. He was never going to schmooze to the, his way to the top. He could no more schmooze than he could slam dunk a basketball. The dinner wasn't anything fancy. They all just traipsed across the street to the steakhouse that had been a fixture on the block well before the firm moved into their new office building the year before. But that was okay. The steakhouse had great food, and it had the kind of old world atmosphere Sergio liked. Wood planted, uh, wood panelled walls, uh, leather chairs, dark stained tables, plush gold carpeting, and ornate wall, wall scones. Got scones? Sc sconces. Why does that word keep coming up? <laughs> I read it as scones, oh my god. Uh, Dale had reserved the restaurant's meeting room, and now Sergio sat at a round table filled with his fellow architects. Twelve of the fourteen in his department were here. Everyone was having a great time, joking, laughing, flirting. Strike that. Everyone but Sergio was having a great time. Yes, he was throwing out one-liners and laughing at the right times, but his heart wasn't in it. Ever since he got on the news of his promotion, he'd been battling a sudden onset of depression he couldn't explain. What was wrong with him? He'd gotten good news, but it didn't feel good at all. So what's it like to be the new project manager? Violet asked as Sergio cut into his medium rare ribeye. The grilled aroma of the beef on his plate combined with savoury scents of butter and onions. The mouth watered as he watched oh sorry, his mouth watered as he watched pink juices run from the steak. He speared the bite he'd just cut apart. Oh, that was a very good description of the steak. I really want steak now. Um Sergio looked at his freckled brunette girlfriend, short and pillowy. Violet was the picture of curvy femininity. To play up her soft features, Violet wore clothes with lots of trim and ruffles and colour. Her wardrobe had sass, as she called it. She, always, she was always asking him if he looked sassy. He wasn't sure how sassy looked, so he always said, You look sassy as heck, babe. 
Basically, he lied. Looking at Violet now, Sergio realized he often lied when it came to Violet. That's not a good way to go. It's not a good way to go. This relationship is already in, <laughs> in the danger. Uh, don't you just love romantic com comedies? Comedies. Violet had asked just the other night as they headed to the theater for yet another romantic comedy movie. Sure do, babe, Sergio said. He hated romantic comedies. Give him a good sci-fi or supernatural movie any day. Even horror was better than a romantic comedy. I hate horror movies, Violet had said on their second date. Don't you? Absolutely, Sergio said. Come on, man. Come on. The same kind of thing happened with food. Everyone seems to love Chinese food, Violet said on their third date. But I don't get the appeal. It's either too bland or too spicy. What do you think? I totally agree, Sergio said. Chinese takeout was one of his favourite things. Violet chose how to spend their time too. On their first date, Violet announced that she was a go-getter. She let Sergio know that quiet nights at home would be rare. My mama always said, You stand still too long, V, and you'll sprout roots. You gotta keep rolling so you don't gather moss. So I like to keep moving, keep doing. When I'm not at work, I'm out having fun, you know? Sergio had nodded even though he was still untangling her mixed metaphors and he really liked hanging out at home. Sure, he said. Life's too short to grow moss on your roots. Man, Violet deserves better. <laughs> Violet deserves better. Uh, Violet thought that this was hilariously funny, which was nice because he liked it when people found his attempts at humour amusing. But it was equally not nice because Violet had a truly obnoxious laugh. A cross between a honk, a siren and a whore. That's so mean. That's so ne mean. Violet's laugh attracted attention the way syrup attracted flies. She'd embarrassed... Sergio on dozens of occasions. He actually started trying not to be amusing. It didn't work. Apparently he was the master of inadvertently saying funny things. Like just this evening. After Dale told him about the promotion, Sergio went to Violet's drafting table and told her the good news. There'll be a dinner tonight. I assume you want to come. She'd laughed as if he just told the best joke ever. He found that baffling. Yes, Violet was smart and yes, they had shared interests and yes, she was pretty fun. But was it really so much to want a girlfriend who liked more of the things he liked? He wondered if they'd still be dating if he told her the truth from the beginning. You, yes, you would, because she likes you for you. Oh my god, this guy doesn't know how relationships work. <laughs> would she even like him if she knew him? Like, really knew him? Heck, sometimes he wasn't sure if she liked the version of him that was pretending to be. Maybe it's because you're lying all the time. <laughs> and sometimes he didn't like her as her much either. Violet was a flirt, even though she was with Sergio. She liked to come on to other men, and not just some men, all men, married or unmarried. Okay, to be fair, that's that's kind of bad. The, both of the characters are kind of, eh. <laughs> you know, they're kind of cool, but there's, there's a little bit about them which I'm like, meh. Sergio lies and, um, and Violet flirts with other men. Uh, she didn't care, she just liked to flirt. Sergio had never liked the flirting, but lately it was getting on his nerves. Sergio? Sergio blinked and looked at Violet. She was tugging on his sleeve. I asked you a question. I'm sorry, what did you ask? I asked about how it feels to be on the new project, project manager, um, waiting until he'd put his first bite of steak in his mouth and chewed it. Sergio gave Violet what he hoped was a natural look that didn't betray his annoyance at her. For once, he gave her an honest answer. Well, I'm not the project manager yet, am I? So I don't know. Violet let loose with her laugh. Sergio looked down and quickly took another bite of the steak. The biggest issue in his relationship was that, well, Violet wasn't the girl he really wanted. Are you kidding me? Are you actually, this relationship is in, in pieces, really. <laughs> but that girl was someone he hadn't seen in years. He wondered what she was doing now. Sophia Manchester started going to Sergio's high school during his junior year. He fell in love with her on the first day she came to class, small and graceful, like a ballerina. Sophia had the dark looks he loved, and she had the face of an angel. She was also very smart, very nice, very funny, and unfortunately very popular. Although she was always perfectly kind to him, and he'd noticed, she seemed to like a lot of the things he liked. They moved in entirely different circles. He didn't stand a chance. But he never forgot her. In the nearly ten years since, she, since he'd seen her, he'd been trying to find a woman like her. Violet, sadly, that was... Violet, sadly, wasn't that woman. Violet patted his leg. 
then turned away from him to flirt with Clive, even though only an airhead would flirt with Clive. Everyone knew Clive was obviously taken by outspoken red-haired Fiona, who sat on the other side now, uh, and Fiona was not a woman to be messed with. Case in point, when Violet leaned toward Clive to rub her chest against his arm, oh my god, no, that, that's more than flirting. <laughs> a spoonful of Fiona's mashed potatoes flew across the table and onto Violet's new blouse. Oh, sorry, Fiona purred into a smooth, confident voice. I don't know how that got away from me. Violet sniffed loudly. An ex extricated, extricated, <laughs> sorry, and extricated the potatoes from her blouse. She leaned away from Clive. Sergio suppressed a smile and concentrated on his, on his steak. The steak was the best part of this evening's celebration. He could have done without the forced camaraderie. Being friendly with other people was hard work, and he was tired tonight. He wanted to go home and stop trying for just a few hours, but he couldn't do that yet. He had to keep eating and bantering and pretending all was right in the world. After most of the plates on the table had been cleared away by the waiters, Dale stood and tapped his water glass. The ding 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 brought up every head at the table. So, Serge, Dale said, we want a speech. You know we do. Everyone except Clive started chanting, speech, 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 speech. Clive was nothing, uh, was mouthing idiot at Sergio. Sergio smiled and stood. I'll make this short and sweet. Everyone cheered. Dale laughed. See, there's a reason this kid has advanced so quickly. Sergio grinned, as he knew he was supposed to. Well, here we go. Thank you, Dale, to you and the partners for the promotion. Dale in inclined his head, smiling. You deserve it. Uh, Sergio smiled. And to the rest of you, he lowered his voice to a growl. You're mine now, maggots, and you don't, you forget it. He sat down. The table was silent for at least three seconds. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God, that was, a, that was a stinky joke. Then Clive burst out laughing and started clapping. Violet joined in, then everyone was laughing. Phew. For a second, Sergio thought he'd blown it. Of course, Violet wanted to go out dancing after the dinner, and she convinced Sergio to invite Clive and Fiona and a couple other architects. Even though Sergio enjoyed showing off his dance moves, they stayed up ridiculously late. Finally, Sergio took Violet home and then headed to his own apartment building a few blocks away. Pulling his two-year-old SUV into his assigned space in the garage under his apartment building, Sergio picked up his suit jacket from the leather passenger seat. He stepped out of the black vehicle, then closed and locked the doors. For a few seconds, he stood and stared at his SUV. He remembered how excited he was when he bought it. He'd been wanting to trade in his old small pickup for a nice SUV for years. Once he'd done it though, he realized he still didn't have the vehicle he truly desired. Why was it that whenever he climbed a little higher on the ladder, he felt like he had too many rungs to go before he re reached the top? Sighing, Sergio left his SUV behind him and took the elevator to the third floor. There, he strode to his apartment, hurrying quickly, uh, sorry, quietly with his uh, back to his neighbor's door. Mrs. Bailey was a busy body, and she liked to ambush him when he got home. Only once in a while did he manage to get past. Oh, it's you, Sergio, Mrs. Bailey's scratchy voice said as Sergio put his key in the lock. I thought I heard an intruder. You're quite late tonight. Hot date? Sergio took a breath, then turned. Hi, Mrs. Bailey. The petite, grey-haired lady beamed at him. In the daytime, she usually wore crispy ironed shirt dresses in pastel colours, but tonight she was sporting a frilly pink nightgown under a white quilted robe. How is work today? Fine. Sergio wasn't going to tell her about the promotion. Oh no, she would have insisted on inviting him for some kind of baked good in spite of the time. He yawned, not just a fake yawn, but a well-timed one. I'm awfully tired, Mrs. Bailey. Please forgive me, but I need to get inside and go to bed. Of course you do, dear. Mrs. Bailey smiled at him. You go get your rest. Sergio thanked his lucky stars and slipped into his apartment before Mrs. Bailey could say anything else. He closed the door behind him and latched all four latches. He leaned back against his door and closed his eyes. Home at last. Sergio had a nice apartment. At 1,200 square feet, it was, t it was far from tiny and the complex had been built only two years before. It sported the most up-to-date appliances and modern features that his architectural eye appreciated. A couple friends from the firm had helped Sergio decorate his apartment and it looked great. 
They'd used neutral beiges and greys that felt both upscale and masculine, and most of the furnishings were expensive antiques. It was a decent place, but he resented that it was in a building that also housed the likes of Mrs. Bailey. He deserved peace, didn't he? He shouldn't have to put up with this nosy old lady who didn't have anything better to do than to torment him. Sergio crossed the living room and went into his bedroom. Removing his wallet from his pocket, he placed it in the ceramic tray he used for his wallet and keys and whatever other detritus might come out of his pocket at the end of the day. He then undressed and carefully hung up his suit and put everything else in the laundry hamper. Tugging on grey sweats and a black t-shirt, he lay down on the bed and dropped immediately into sleep. The next morning, his alarm woke him up at 6am. Feeling groggy and foggy, he groaned and turned on the TV. Flipping through the channels, he thought about the long day that he had ahead. He should get moving. He looked at his phone on his Queen Anne ne uh, cherry nightstand. He checked his watch. It wasn't too early. He picked up the phone. Leaning back on a pile of grey, white and beige pillows, Sergio listened to the phone ring. It was picked up on the third one. Hello? His mother's lightly accented voice said. Mama, Sergio said. Sergio, what a nice surprise. Something rustled against the phone and her voice was muffled as she called. Tony, come here. It's Sergio on the phone. Her voice returned to full volume and beyond when she shouted into the phone. Sergio, you still there? I'm putting you on speaker. Your papa is doing his morning workout. Tony, come here. Come talk to Sergio on the speaker. Sergio shook his head. His mother sure did love her speakerphone. How's our Sergio? A deep voice boomed into the phone. Have you built any skyscrapers lately? <laughs> I don't know why I chose that accent. <laughs> the machine gun laugh that came after this ridiculous question was joined by his mother's wild giggling. Sergio shook his head again. You know I don't build skyscrapers, Papa. I'm in the residential renovation department of the firm. So renovate skyscraper apartment buildings in a town where the tallest building is 10 stories high. You have to be a visionary son if you want it all. You can't reach the top without being able to see the top. You have to be bold and, dar and daring to stand out. <laughs> Tony Altieri knew about being bold and daring and being on the top. The head of a massive transportation company, Sergio's dad was one impressive man. By the time Sergio was born, when Tony was 30, Tony had already built his empire and a mansion for his wife and new baby. Since then, his business only continued to grow. Today, he was not he not only filled his mansion with the best furniture and art and cars, but he also bought more houses to fill with furniture, art and cars. I got a promotion today, Sergio said. The one I told you I applied for. I got it. Head of the company? Tony. <laughs> I use a different accent every time. Tony asked, laughing again. Tony, be nice, Sergio's mother said. Congratulations, Sergio. We're so proud of you. We have to have a celebration. Your favourite pasta and cake. We have to have a cake. What was the job you applied for again? Project manager. That sounds nice, his mother said. Tony snorted. Don't rest in your lawyers, Sergio. Always upward. Did you catch the game last night? <laughs> Sorry, I'm making myself laugh with this stupid accent. Sergio noticed he was gritting his teeth and he forced himself to relax. I saw the score. I missed the game because we all went out to dinner to celebrate my promotion. Did you meet anyone? Sergio's mother asked. No, Mama. It was just the people in my department. Violet is the only woman there who's interested in me. They got no taste. At least Violet knows a good thing when she sees it. Sergio's mother snorted. She wasn't Violet's biggest fan. Sergio made his excuses to get off the phone as fast as he could. He was asking himself why he called his parents to begin with. Well, he knew why he called them. He called them to get validation. He was trying to feel like he'd finally gotten enough to have arrived. Why in the world did he think he'd get that validation from his father? All the rich food he ate the night before must have slowed down his brain function.